On the eve of the Armenian Genocide nearly 100 years ago, the United States was a young nation with almost no experience whatsoever in Middle Eastern affairs. The genocide provided an opportunity for America to experiment with intervention, including notably the launch of the Near East Foundation. America's specific actions toward the Armenians from 1915 to 1927 established a general model that was to become a blueprint for American foreign policy worldwide ever since. In dealing with the Armenian Genocide, the United States established a legacy of paradox. The paradox is this. The self-interest that impelled the United States to engage on behalf of the Armenians is the same self-interest that impelled the United States to abandon the Armenians, leaving relief and subsequent development to non-governmental international organizations such as the Near East Foundation. From its beginnings, the United States traditionally shied away from foreign entanglements, as George Washington cautioned in his legendary farewell address when our first president was about to leave office in 1796. He warned the young nation against getting involved at all in the global power struggles. This expedient advice is still used in foreign policy discussions today in the United States. However, throughout the 19th century, America's self-image and its sense of its role in the world slowly edged away from isolationism and warily at first grew closer and closer to adopting internationalism. Though they appeared to be opposite on the surface, these movements, isolationism and internationalism, are ironically driven by the same impulse to protect and strengthen the self-interest of the United States. Each was a search for power based on expediency. In the end, each would lead to the abandonment of moral principle in the case of the Armenians. By the end of the 1800s, the United States had become convinced of its urgent obligation to export American principles of freedom and self-determination to what it viewed as a ruined, oppressed world. Instead of avoiding global involvement, America began to hunger to propagate its power and influence abroad. In fact, the United States believed it could reach its own national salvation by saving others overseas. Soon many Americans began to believe that the mission to save others, which would of course come to include the Armenians, was enmeshed in America's own mission to pursue its chosen role in the world. Rescuing starving Armenians echoed as a slogan in America for many generations. It was true, as President Woodrow Wilson noted, that the fate of Armenia was always of special interest to the American people. While seemingly altruistic on the surface, this impulse was driven by self-interest. One strengthens himself or herself or a nation itself by saving others. This outlook influences American internationalism even today. The first wave of American imperialism in the Middle East began with American missionaries who established in the 1830s what was to become a thriving field of operation in Turkey. These Yankee evangelists paved the way for the American political involvement that eventually would follow. The missionaries were torchbearers for what they saw as America's destiny to recreate itself, searching the globe for new and fertile fields. These 19th century American Protestant evangelists embodied a paradox, the legacy of which we may observe today, and for example, when President George Bush's administration spearheaded in 2002 our mission in Iraq, they were confident it was their special duty to impose their will on the lives of others, and they believed this while upholding the principle of self-determination of all peoples. It is astonishing to many to discover that until the 1930s, the United States did not even have a coherent set of policy objectives in the Middle East. Besides safeguarding the American missionaries, missionaries and their valuable property there, there was in fact no US policy in the Middle East. In fact, there wasn't even an official American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire until 1906. The US State Department did not even have a Near Eastern Affairs Division 
until 1909, only six years before the Armenian Genocide. In attempts to overcome this languid American diplomacy, the missionaries just pressed their own cases with Turkish officials. In fact, historian John DeNovo aptly characterized the missionaries as do-it-yourself diplomats. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the unchallenged missionary policy in Turkey was American policy in Turkey. The American missionary movement therefore flourished in this environment. It stood in the vanguard of American internationalism and on the eve of the Armenian Genocide, the missionaries clearly operated as America's foreign policy makers in the Middle East. The missionary leadership acting together with President Wilson and US Congress were to launch what would be seen as an unprecedented humanitarian relief drive on behalf of the Armenian people. Only a few weeks after the Armenian Genocide began on April 24, 1915, America's ambassador to Turkey, Henry Morgenthau, urgently cabled America's Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, requesting relief funds for the Armenians. Some say starvation threatens. Please help quickly, he wrote. Secretary of State Bryan immediately forwarded this request to America's leading missionary statesman, James Barton, who was the Foreign Secretary of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, known as the ABCFM. Headquartered at 1 Beacon Street in Boston, the ABCFM was the largest American missionary organization operating in Turkey. 145 missionaries, 800 native workers, 114 churches, 13,000 converts, 60,000 students, 132 higher grade schools, and over 1,100 lower grade schools run in Turkey as of 1900. When Secretary of State Bryan contacted the ABCFM regarding Mor Morgenthau's urgent request for funds, he thus wedded the United States government and the missionaries in joint Middle Eastern pursuits. The missionaries in the Turkish field worked jointly with US consuls in Turkey to help over 150,000 survivors who fled to Syria and the nearly 200,000 Armenian refugees who fled to the Russian Caucasus. Naively thinking in 1915 that all they would need was about $100,000 to provide relief, uh, the fundraisers were very gleeful when they raised twice that amount in the first year. However, they quickly realized that that was hardly enough. Uh, fundraising efforts eventually took on the nature of multinational uh, business operation. In 1916, almost two and a half million dollars was donated, and that doubled to about five million the following year. In 1918, the receipts jumped to just over seven million. But following the armistice, the field for relief became wide open. In 1919, the US Congress granted a charter to the Near East uh, Relief Organization, which we will hear more about later today. And they, in their first year, raised $19.5 million. The US government would eventually donate about $25 million total in supply, service, and cash uh, towards Armenian relief. Indeed, America had assumed the moral mandate for the Middle East. Previously, Americans had experimented with internationally philanthropic um, activities. For example, in the 1820s, Americans gave privately to support Greeks in their war of independence against the Ottomans. Again, in the 1840s, Americans dug deep into their wallets to help the Irish who were starving during the potato famine, and incidentally, that potato famine was actually a genocide engineered by the English government in London. And as you know, in 1895 and 1896, Americans also gave generously to help the Armenian victims of the massacres under Abdul Hamid. However, during the genocide, brand new barriers were broken by expanding both the nature and the amount of support of American philanthropy uh, that was given during the Armenian genocide. The United States led the world in feeding, housing, clothing, caring for, and educating the Armenian refugee population. As one American peace negotiator declared in 1920, it is no exaggeration to say that the Armenians would have disappeared as a nation had it not been 
for America, which transcended any known national charity in America at that time, was a clear expression of America's self-interest blended with American idealism. Americans gave to save the Armenians, not just out of sympathy, but because the country as a whole looked actively to transplant a blend of Christianity and American democracy overseas in order to recreate America overseas. The mission to save Armenians became enmeshed in America's mission to pursue its self-perceived unique role in the world. America's uh, population embraced international activism and disregarded George Washington's cautionary farewell address. In a repudiation of George Washington's warning against overseas entanglements, Americans clearly believed it was their duty to save the Armenian people. This was an outright moral and political test of the special mission of America. Americans believed that their own strength as a nation came from their deliverance of the Armenians. This motive was dualistic. It was charitable and self-serving at the same time. Its morality purified its expediency. Though peace came after World War I ended, the Armenians were not better off for it. Starting with the Mudros Armistice with Turkey at the end of World War I, the course of post-war settlements only worsened conditions for Armenians. The Allies were actually reviving Turkish power and sovereignty. Americans could scarcely believe it, but gripped by their own post-war isolationism, they wouldn't do anything about it. The role that the Allies played in putting the Turks back in their saddle was unintentional at first, but did begin to dawn on the American people around 1920. The Allied policies, the Allied secret agreements, the Allies' internal squabbling, all fell right into the hands of the Turks and helped to rebuild the Turkish army, unified the fragmented Turkish population, and repaired the Turks' broken spirit under the rising leadership of Kemal. Before long, the Turks were restored to power, flushed with success, all thanks to the Allies. Despondent, the old Scotsman and staunch Armenian advocate Viscount James Bryce remarked in 1921, Armenia seems entirely abandoned. This held poor consequences at first for the American missionaries in Turkey after the war. The xenophobic Turkish nationalists clamped down on foreign missionaries as unwanted intruders in Turkey. The secular Kemalist regime expelled numerous missionaries, levied oppressive taxes, seized missionary property, closed the thriving missionary medical facilities, and only allowed the missionaries to teach Turkish studies in the missionary schools, and never to mention Christianity. Furthermore, the Turkish government would only allow the American missionaries to stay in Turkey if the American missionaries promised to sever their ties with the Armenian population still living in Turkey after the genocide. Thus, to preserve their considerable operations in Turkey, the American missionaries opted to cut their bonds with the very Armenian Protestant community they had created. Only a few missionaries opposed what they considered their leadership's unchristian and hypocritical appeasement of the Turks, and those few missionaries resigned. Thus, the search for power that drove the missionary involvement with the Armenians as a form of religious imperialism would now come to drive missionary abandonment of the Armenians. This is the paradox that was to replay itself over and over in American policy, not only towards the Armenians, but towards the world in general. Significantly, the American people, loyal to the Armenians, could forgive neither the Turks nor the missionaries, since the price for appeasement was desertion of the Armenians. And it is important to note that the Near East Foundation continued to serve the Armenian people. Though kicked out of Armenia in 1927 by Stalin and his Soviet buddies, the Near East Foundation was able to return in 2004 to resume its dedication to serving Armenians. In 1927, the U.S. State Department restored diplomatic relations with Turkey, but they used an executive agreement to do this. An executive agreement did not need the consent of the U.S. Senate. Therefore, 
the State Department was able to sidestep not only the Senate, but to sidestep American public opinion, which was hostile to restoring uh, diplomatic relations with Turkey, a Turkey who was seen as unremorseful then and, as we know, unremorseful today. As a final insult to the Armenians, the American missionaries acted jointly with the American government as architects of the post-war reconciliation with the Turks that played out at the Lausanne Conference in Switzerland. It better served the self-interests of the Washington policymakers as well as the missionary uh, leaders to disengage from the Armenians in the 1920s and instead align themselves with Kemal's Turkey. Thus, the self-interest that initially underwrote America's commitment to the Armenians drove its very demise. Self-contradiction is the enduring legacy that marks American foreign policy even today. On the one hand, today, there seems to be an opposition to nation building and foreign entanglements, making George Washington's farewell address still relevant. On the other hand, however, American leaders today have also espoused a missionary-like dedication in exporting American democracy and in advocating American intervention around the world, as we see today in the Middle East, both impulses driven by a desire to empower America without relying on any other country. Thank you very much.